Paula is a senior researcher at the Center of Social Studies. Um, Maria Paula Menezes brings us a presentation with the title Religions as Politics, Reclaiming Silenced Epistemologies and, and Ontologies in Southern Africa. Paula, please. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'll try to be brief to keep on on time. Uh, first of all, thank you for your very inspiring talk yesterday and for the privilege to be here listening to you both today. And as I said in my presentation, I think we all speak from a specific location, so I am speaking from Southern Africa, Southeast Africa. And the first comment I want to make is that once we are talking about Southeast Africa, we need to shift away from the colonial perspective developed about the, ge the geopolitical representations of the world. As being part of the Indian Ocean meant, above all, to be part of the first very big global globalizing project, mm -hmm. which was the project that initiated at the beginning of our era. And it meant also the creation of commercial, religious, cultural, intellectual exchanges across the Indian Ocean, a shift that was briefly stopped by colonial interventions but it really shapes the Indian Ocean and we cannot analyze the Indian Oceans with the perspective developed for the Atlantic Ocean. So my first question is that we need to develop different canonical and theoretical frameworks to understand where we came from. So this sort of reflection that I bring to you both dialogues a lot with uh, what uh, the group that Farid al is working with in Malaysia and in that region and also what women do is carrying out it says. What means to think from the south? Which south are we located at? The different souths we belong to? And how can we create dialogues among different epistemologies beyond the visa lines that divides the metropolitan Eurocentric knowledge that is very much present as Farid yesterday discussed and the world that is much broader than the European definition of the world and especially the problem that we have in our academia is the question of the impossibility of coexistence in both sides of the lines meaning that where Eurocentric knowledge exists the other knowledge can only be partial, periphery, local but not <coughs> as important as so that is a clear sign of the seminal universalism to use the Suleiman Bashir Diagnes analysis the pos position of one who declares his own particularity to be universal. And that is the big problem we have of a certain universal, a project of universality that has been developed in the North Atlantic and it's trying to pro project itself as the reference for the world. Thus, many of the global references are based upon defining a specific corpus of interpretation, mostly of Eurocentric origin that are most of the information that is kept nowadays, as Valentin Moutin would say, in the European archives, in the European libraries. And this movement, so this raises a series of epistemological and ontological questions in times when decolonization is more than ever a growing challenge. As Boaventura Santos advances with the epistemology of the South, in line with Alata's intellectual provocation, if the epistemological diversity of the world is to be accounted for, other theoretical frames of reference must be known and developed and anchored in other epistemologies to account adequately for the realities that represent the global south. And I think here we really need to bear in mind that lots of the, the remnants of this complex critique and analysis of the world is beyond the Eurocentric interpretation even of the colonial reality and thus we have to move away from this very myopic analysis of colonialism that is very present in European uh, scholarship and to try to recapture other after, other trajectories of struggle and that is the core argument of my presentation. Therefore this raises a question, what is universalism? What is the possibility of a dialogue? Historicism recognizing as a reversible progress of the human world whose compassion will be European, was the support 
they force the entry of the others into civilization by force quite often, judged by the Euro uh, European project to be barbaric or outside history. Therefore, three quarters of humanity were outside history and remain outside history because their voices are not part of the construction of another history. So this is my argument. Why are we not being capable of being heard outside of the scope? And humanism supports the ethical and theoretical promotion not of any human being, but of humanities that must be distinguished from the many anthropological types that make up still the references about the non-European world. Close to Alatar's arguments in responses to Eurocentrism, the modern knowledge holds a prescriptive notion of a certain knowledge that conforms the modern capitalist and colonial world. As Ibarth said, exposed, there are multiple cultural artifacts exported to the colonial world as a way to impose a bourgeois reference to fortify the structure of attitude and reference that remains central to colonial and imperial endeavors. That's what makes sense to speak about the universal. It's a very local universal that we use still to try to translate ourselves. Thus, as stressed by Alatas in several works, there are simply concepts that permeate social science and humanities. The linearity of teleological narratives of progress towards civilization stand clearly in the way towards acknowledging the relevance of non-eurocentric projects with knowledge is producing theories. I will shortly stress some problems associated with the arbitrary nature of our disciplinary and eurocentric academic interpretations and the impacts resulting from any attempt to impose a single narrative about our world. To think from other epistemologies entails to recognizing that there are other ontologies. It entails to revisit the long history, for example, of Islamic present in Africa. It's intersecting points with colonial projects, some quite often subcontracted to Arab and South Asian masters, as well as shared histories of struggles and anti-capitalist ambitions. For many non-African Muslims, it means a much needed, in my opinion, and long overdue revision of this intertwined history, as well as a language, a language and artistic expression that deals with Africa, blackness, Afro-Arab in a reactionary, racist, and the political terms. As several scholars have insisted, many academics researching about Islam share position with Eurocentric colleagues when discussing topics such as anti-black racism, fixating themselves on skin color and visual representations, expressing this way their own racial anxieties. It is if, if anti-black racism has no history trajectory or realities beyond the stigma assigned to it or the North Atlantic rhetoric argumentation surrounding it. And just to make a small comment, for example, right now, young East and North Africans have been embracing their Africanness in opposition to Arabness, often citing Arab racism <laughs> and discriminatory <laughs> politics as a reason to depart from some of these historical bonds. And if you analyze current struggles in Algeria and Sudan, that, that is a very good example. I notice how often writers that deal with Islamic African world including the North and East African regions, seem at ease with othering Africa, insisting in grasping an imaginary Arab world made up by the Atlantic North, basically US, France, and UK. Here, a common feature is the inaccurate treatment of black experiences and culture as being just an homogeneous and single sun. From Zanzibar until Emeraldus in Ecuador, we are all the same. In post-colonial times, or can we change the rules of the game? Or can one be more inclusive? Or can we recognize the diversity of the subjects? The criticism of Eurocentrism that includes many Eastern intellectuals calls for an approach along the lines of the epistemologies of the South to find endogenous but functional frameworks of analysis that support the struggles for existence and for meaning. Above all, I think, it is time to recognize that, as Bovento has been stressing, there is no more f space for a single theory about otherness, about alternative, but a theory of alternative made of alternatives. So I think we need to start really thinking in the broader and finding ways to bridge it across different perspectives. Broadening the case also involves the exercise of separating ourselves from the eurocentric model of agency 
based on the moral and political autonomy of the subject in relation to power, by limiting our capacity to understand and question the lives of people, of commoners, whose senses of being were configured with, within non-liberal traditions. It is necessary, in my opinion, to separate the notion of agency from the ideas of resistance that have been generally placed that have, in, that have generally placed indigenous, colonized people in a position of an object without voice, because only in this way will it be possible to understand sensitivities, commitments, and effectivities, and to identify their contribution to the construction of commonality. In short, it's an expression I like very much in Portuguese. We need to avoid victimhood, as victimhood is one of the bigger risks of our time. And to end the section, I suggest an universal position can be achieved only if we are serious about reckoning with colonial modernity, if we draw on diversity of the global and imperial self as a key feature to put forth a strategic universalism, unifying diversity beyond Eurocentrism. Universality does not exist in abstract, as a prescriptive principle which is mechanically applied to different circumstances. And it links to what Tiago was talking about, the ecumenic thought, this was right a while ago. It is created and recreated as an act of insurgency, which does not demand emancipation solely for those who share my identity, but for everyone. It says that no one will be an object, a person without will, without community. It equally refuses to freeze the oppressed in a status of victimhood that requires protection from above, especially from Europe. It insists that emancipation is self-emancipation and that self-determination is above all about self-affirmation, about the right to write its own history. It is a fundamental element of reacquiring history, of being agents of entangled histories. The nationalist struggles in Africa were very much aligned with insurgent struggles in Asia. For both, the capture of colonial state institutions had to go hand in hand with the appropriation of national economy. As stated by Milcar Cabral in the early 1970s, if imperialist domination has the vital need to practice cultural oppression, then national liberation is necessarily and above all an act of cultural liberation. Thus, in its most fully and radical form, I think the colonization as a political practice would mean a total transformation, an entry into history and humanity of ontologically neglected subjects. Decolonization, in this sense, is not only about the disappearance of colonialism, but also about the disappearance of the colonized object and turn into subjects whose material and moral universe is challenging the colonial the colonial presence that still permeates our university. This break, breaking up includes breaking up the colonial disciplines and the preoccupation of the academic areas that deal with the imperial past, from law to sociology, from history to anthropology, to name a few, that conform our universities, and which are, in my opinion, so a, for, a sort of soft power that has been trying over the last decades to trying to disentangle the struggles from the practice of the people. And this very much fought, it's very much present in our academia. We talk about people, we don't talk about the struggles they were involved in. Why have we been marginalizing or simply forgetting the radical theorizing of decolonization and the taking by resistance revolutionary subject during the long 20th century? Why is it so difficult to name people from the global south? Let me go quickly now to my second argument. To speak from the South, from the South challenges this core periphery model and the argument about the core, what is the core, because we have many cores in the world. And as Alatas yesterday stressed, once we start really provincializing the world, we'll see that there are many worlds making our world, and it really requires a new theore theoretical framework to grasp this diversity of the multipolar world. However, to think religiously is also about language, it's also about the concepts we use. And as stressed yesterday, the concepts chosen to express a specific problem, if they are used outside the areas and periods of origin, they can distort the problem. And this is a case we have, it's a very quick example, when the Portuguese arrived in Mozambique, what is now Mozambique in the 16th century, they came to see that part of the world through the eyes <coughs> 
of the believers that were there. So they divided Mozambique between the community, the Huma of the believers, and the Kafir, those who were not believers. And because the British did not understand what the Kafir means, transformed that world into a nasty world, meaning an incompetent black person. So that th those are the problems with the complexity of the concepts. On the trajectory following this, this key question, I think that we need to really to understand the implications of being part of different worlds, in this case the Indian world, and what was the meaning and implications of the presence of the Portuguese colonials, the modern colonials, that meant in, that, in the case of Mozambique the transformation of the colony into a Portuguese reference, where the dominant religion was Catholicism. Islam, in its diversity, was removed from the picture very quickly. Mozambique, together with Tanzania and Kenya, are not perceived, even today, as old centers of Islamic tradition, being it specifically the African Islam, recited in local languages through Shiraz-inspired Islamic traditions. In line with the Orientalistic approaches, the Portuguese sought to emphasize the Islam in northern Mozambique not as a true Islamic akin to the ones in the Middle East, but as a syncretic, a mixed Islam with gro mixed with gross superstitions, such as fetishes, witchcraft, and so on. This approach aimed at affirming an abyssal ontological and epistemological distinction between the Portuguese and Islam as the Orient still marks very much the reality. When Muslim conception and practice were not in conformity with the classic representations of Islam, they were transformed into an abnormality. Islam in Mozambique was not only removed from the core of the orthodox Islamic essence, but also appeared to be a form of aberration, a peculiar kind not translated into black Islam, which in Mozambique, according to the Portuguese colonial scholars, resulted from biological and spiritual mixings, as analyzed by the Azad Bonat. The Portuguese would insist that Africans, because less developed, were not capable of comprehending the intellectual and spiritual dimension of Islam in their own. Thus, in order to explain the historical roots of northern Mozambique Islam, the Portuguese underlined that it was brought or imposed on African by Persians, Arab Sharifs, and Indians. And the analysis used followed the orientalistic approach, emphasizing that these three groups of Asian Muslims had settled on the coast and embarked on a missionary activity similar to Catholicism, trying to evangelize people for, to Islam. In following this approach, the colonial perspective showed that religion is structured institution, as an institutional religion using the concept of religion brought, borrowed from Christianity. What is worse is that with independence in 1975, the secular state inherited this approach and reinforced the private character of religion, forbidding it during the first years of independence. Worse still, the homogenizing approach towards religion after independence resulted in the case of Islam in hiding complexities, forgetting, for example, the presence of tariqas such as Shaudulia and the Quadiria. Also, the diversity of spiritualities and cosmologies present in the territory became again described as African religion or African animalistic traditions relegated to an almost irrelevant role in discussing religion. So what is the hierarchy about religion? Shouldn't we be discussing this colonial approach towards the hierarchy of, of what is considered a religious thought? Thus, any religious activity performed by Africans that did not have a clear equivalent in European Christian practice was likely to be attributed to a vague category of African religion, or worse, as witchcraft, without any regard for the moral value of these spiritualities. So my question here, and back to the argument, how to decode <coughs> history, it means to recognize other intellectual theories and to generate dialogues that provincialize all contributions beyond the core periphery. How can we really promote a, an ecology of, of knowledges? Going back to Alaud's proposal with Vignette Sinha, how can we decolonize sociology, history, and law? How can we provincialize knowledges to generate contemporary, tendentially horizontal dialogues between concepts and theories? My final argument is that a possible example of an approach, it's a dialogue between Islamic traditions, such as Wasabi, as you suggested yesterday, and Ubuntu. 
The philosophical principle of Ubuntu is constructed within a framework of human relations where one exists because related to others, to spirituality and to nature. Thus, the identification of humanness activates a collective sense of personhood, of the person, not the individual, but the person, as an integral being, within a dialogical framework that might entail various <coughs> cosmological perspectives. Through this perspective, favoring lateral, horizontal, off-center contacts, we might contribute towards decolonizing our world in a reciprocal way, under which we can really relearn from each other what needs to be human. This will be a journey between individuals, spiritualities, and environments, without any absolute point of reference from which they are judged or doubt, privileging oral accounts, what we have been theorizing as order to. This could be a middle ground towards a stronger set of epistemologies of the South. Baghdad, Fesh, Timbuktu, Cairo, Zanzibar, are spaces of philosophical life, plugged in in multiple universes, drawing from multiple non-European intellectual traditions. These movements of transfer and translation complicate the production of a single history. They are not continental nor linear. They are intertwined across seas, continents, island, deserts, and forests. These knowledges are kept and transmitted orally by the sages. Thus, the ontological <coughs> diversity of the continent of Africa emerges not as object, but subjects of knowledge. And these are the protagonists <coughs> of the colonization project, calling for a complete liberation for cognitive justice.